Well, I just want to, uh, to welcome you again here this morning. And as said, my name is Todd McPherson. I'm a coach and speaker with the John Maxwell team. I have other leadership roles as well, but I really love the opportunity to train on leadership and to, to coach people. If, if you're new or just joining us, I've mentioned it before, but we're going through this book. Uh, all the chapters we've been covering, the topics we've been covering are from John's The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. This was actually the earlier version. This is the 10th anniversary edition. John rewrote, I think, 70-some percent of this book for, for this next edition. Originally, he was going to be change a few stories and amalgamate two chapters, which, of course, is anybody who loves to do things with excellence, you know, you, you start into something and you decide that there's way too many things. And that he was telling us the story, how he, uh, you know, got into it and suddenly realized, no, I'm going to change just about all of this book. So... And uh, so I love it. I love the new version. But for me, it was the, the original version. I believe it was my dad that handed it to me. And it was just at the right time in my uh, early years of leadership where I was realizing that leadership was something more than just a position you had or an instinct that you think or just something you kind of stumbled into. I was realizing that leadership was a skill set I needed to develop. And that book came along at just the right time. And it's been, it's been a key part of, of my life. And I look forward to to our looking through a couple chapters again this morning. <clears throat> Let me start off by telling you about my experience some years back on the log run. Have you ever been to an amusement park and rode the log run? You know it goes down that wall. Yeah, come on, show of hands. I want to see how many people. Okay, you, you, you've been on that. We were at Canada's Wonderland there in Toronto. I believe that's what it's called. It was a number of years ago. My wife and I, two other couples, decided that one of the first things, we we brought teams of of, of high school students and uh, we were heading off to do a mission work in different teams but we decided that the one day we just let them run wild at Canada's Wonderland it had a fence around it and they weren't allowed to leave so we figured that was pretty safe and uh, we let them go and have a blast and so there we were three couples and we decided first thing we do is hit the log run it looked like an easier ride that we could do as couples our wives weren't too much into the adventurous ones so it sounded good so we got on there, you know, you go ticking up the thing, and that, the big part of the log run, of course, is basically just that one slide, right? Into the huge amount of water, you get splashed, a little spray, you're a little damp, you go around the rest of it, you come out, it was an enjoyable experience, and we get out. And uh, when you, because it goes in a loop, you kind of get, exit the other side, and we're now in the center of this area, and you've got to walk over this little bridge that just happens to cross right next to the the spot where it comes down, right? And the bridge gets sprayed. And my friend Dave then says, hey, I've got a great idea. Now, have you noticed that when guys say, hey, I've got a great idea, a great idea never actually follows? <laughs> um, the long history, in fact, our, our men's fishing trips we used to do at our church, we'd always joke that whenever a guy said, hey, I've got a great idea, just one second, we'll get 911 on the phone. Tell us your idea. We're going to do it. It's just, you know, it, it, it doesn't follow with a great idea. It usually has things like, wow, that was a close one, or I'm sure they can stitch that right up. Uh, that'll be fine. A few stitches, a bit of a battle. It, it's never a great idea. And this was one of those things. His idea was, why don't we stand on the bridge, wait for the next log run to come down, and get hit by the spray of water? And this seemed really cool to us guys. And our wives said, you know, go right ahead. But we're standing over here where it's safe and dry. So we were standing there watching the big rye go up to the top, knowing it's about to come down. And then it comes and it hits that water. Now, it seemed like an impact when you were on the thing. But from our perspective now, we realized how much water. We just had just enough time to look at each other with that expression that says, this may not have been our best idea. And then brace ourselves. And we were all three pretty solid guys. If anybody had been lighter, you would not have stayed on the bridge. We didn't get sprayed. We didn't get splashed. We got hit with this hurricane force wall of water. It was unbelievable. I mean, we were, for the next minute, we stood there and water left our bodies. Our clothes had inflated. We got hit with so much water. They literally, your jeans were out to their maximum capacity. One of the guys took his hat off and literally water, you know the cartoons? It did that, like it, his hat had filled with water. We had never been so wet in our lives. Every, you couldn't have, you'd have had to dive into water and it still would have taken longer to get that wet than what happened to us on that bridge. <laughs> and then it dawned on us. It was summer, but it was one of those gray, overcast, cool breeze days. And this was 9.30 in the morning. 
And there is no towels, nothing. We are, like, our shoes are pouring water still as we're leaving this ride. And, uh, and our wives don't even want to walk near us because we are the, everybody's staring at these guys that are just, what happened? They fell in. No, we did this to ourselves. You know, uh, it just, it was terrible. And we froze for the next several hours as we slowly drip dried. It was not our brightest moment. And the interesting thing was it, we lost track of our priorities for the day. And I don't know about you, but that was kind of a fun moment. But I've had more than a few times in life where I'm doing something and I've lost track of my priorities. In fact, I can be very effectively accomplishing a task and doing a great job of it, and it can be consuming a lot of my time, and it really has nothing to do with what I need to be about. Have you, have you ever been there? Yeah, you look back and going, now this is great, great progress. But Well, actually, I love Stephen Covey. Uh, uh, John, John Maxwell quotes uh, a Stephen, but he tells this story, one of his books, <clears throat> where he says, you know, um, a manager is the fellow who, the manager is the fellow that if, if a team was cutting through a jungle, creating a road through a jungle, the manager is the one that, that gets the team working to their to the best productivity. I mean, everybody's saws are sharp when they need to be sharp. The team knows how many hours to work. They're resting the optimal time. I mean, they're just, the managers get that team performing at peak performance. But it's the leader that climbs to the tallest tree, surveys the entire situation, and goes, great progress, wrong jungle. <laughs> and the thing is, is whether you're leading a team of people, or as John says, the hardest person he's ever had to lead, and will always the hardest person to lead is himself, and I've been finding that's true as well. It's so much easier to tell another person how they could get better than to tell myself and then execute on that. You know what I'm talking about? And so the hardest person is to lead ourselves. So in life, we are managing ourselves and we're leading ourselves. And there are times that we are in the middle of being really effective, but we're in the wrong jungle. And so we're going to look at priorities today. And um, one of the things that's amazed me not in a good way, but it's amazed me in leadership and in talking with leaders. There's a number of leaders over the years that I've talked to that when, when you ask them, they're really not at all clear on what their priorities are. They really don't know what their why is. They know a lot of the things they do. They, they know that when they show up tomorrow at work, this has got to be done, this has got to be done. They just, they're not clear on what their top 20% of things. How do you make the biggest difference? And what do you have to do that nobody else can do? A lot of those questions have never been asked by them. And as a result, we all get off course. We all lose sight of our priorities. But you can never readjust your priorities if you're not clear on them. So John talks about the law of priority as being one of the fundamental things about leadership. And he says, leaders understand that activity is not necessarily accomplishment. I mean, as leaders, in every single team you'll lead, every, every, pretty much every role you'll have in life, it's easy to get busy. It's almost inevitable to get busy. And it's easy to become distracted in solving problems, dealing with issues, all kinds of things, and that can cause us to veer off course, to lose sight of those big things that we need to do. And my frustration in, in life is that the big things that I really need to do never come with the red flag that screams, you've got to do this now. If it gets to that stage, it's usually too late for those big things. It's, it's like a relationship. You don't build a relationship when there's the crisis. That's when you draw on the strength of relationship to fix the crisis together. Or you damage further relationship or you part ways. But the part of building the relationship or the part of investing those core priority things is always in that realm of, I need to do this, it's just not urgent. It's usually important, but not urgent. So getting clear on our priorities is, is really essential because we always veer off course. I uh, was talking with someone a little while ago and we were talking about the process of creating a blueprint for your week and kind of taking a look at what are the key things you need to accomplish in your week. And of course, the, the fun thing about creating that kind of a plan for your week is your week never turns out according to plan. And uh, I think that's obvious. Uh, it's never done that for me. I've, I've never met a leader that it has. But I've met one or two people that kind of challenge that, well, what's the point then of creating the blueprint? Just, just let the week happen and go with it. Well, my dad was a civil engineer, uh, and he would talk about, you know, of course, any large project that you're building, uh, 
never goes exactly as planned because you're not sure what was quite under the ground there. You find this surprise, that surprise, this challenge, that little thing. That's inevitable. The blueprint never quite goes according to plan. But I'm not comfortable with any idea of crossing a bridge that the uh, builders decided, well, we knew that the blueprint wasn't going to work, so we just, we just won it. We just thought we'd just, let's see what happens. Okay, you, you go ahead, I'll just stay safely over here, thanks. And I think in life it's that thing, because it's the blueprint and the plan, the priorities, it's not about having the perfect week. It's not about being in complete control of your life. It's about recognizing what's truly most important. Very seldom have we heard anybody ever say on their deathbed, I wish I got more tasks done. But we have often heard people say they wish they'd pursued their dreams more, or built better relationships with family, or invested in something that will live on beyond them. Priorities. In John's chapter on priorities, he, he talks about three R's that are key. And you've got the on your notes there. The three R's to keep focused on his priorities. Number one, what is required? So we can ask ourselves as a leader, what must I do that nobody can or should do for me? Number two, what gives the greatest return? We ask ourselves, is the majority of my time working in my areas of greatest strength? And sometimes it's not. I've been in leadership roles where it's not. And that doesn't mean you just you know, quit on the leadership role and you certainly can't just you know, cold turkey tell everybody, I'm not doing this anymore, this is what I love to do, period. Like it or lump it kind of a thing. But you do have to very intentionally start to move yourself to be able to work into your strengths and who can replace you in these things that just are not you. Third, what brings the greatest reward? Am I doing the things I love? <clears throat> now, in every role I've had in leadership, there's always things I don't love about it. It's part of life, right? But it's so critical for us to find ways that we can do some of the pieces of what we love. Stephen Covey has that phrase of sharpening the saw. And if we're not investing in those things that recharge us, if we're not giving expression to those things that, I like the phrase resonate. My wife is very musical, and I've learned a lot of things through that. But if you've ever been playing, especially, I love a, a, every now and then a really good classical piece of music, and you got it on nice and loud, and then just certain notes, and something in the room begins to resonate with the frequency of that note. And it's just a way, it's so neat that this, this physical object's actually responding to this music. I find that interesting, and just for me, it's always been just an illustration that there's these moments where I resonate. Just who I am, it just, it begins to vibrate with just the person I am and what I'm made to do. And so knowing what that is and knowing how to work that into my life and particularly my leadership roles makes me a much happier person, which always makes me a better leader. <clears throat> I, I seldom, if ever, have had anybody come to me and say, you know, Todd, you smile too much, and you're a little too happy. But I have many times had family and a few close people say, are, is there, you've been frowning a lot today. Are, are you in a bad mood? I think you need to lighten up a little bit. And I think I'm just in a fine mood. I'm just working hard, head down. Don't you know how serious this crisis is, everybody? You know, and that kind of, a, a, and often that need to lighten up. And one of the ways I found is when I'm intentional about saying, what do I love to do? Even if it's for a short bit, even if I can carve out this little bit of space, there's something that I love to do. Maybe it's for me, maybe it's my own growth and development, maybe it's making a difference to somebody else. And sometimes just reminding myself that, you know what, that, that, and that conversation, I love, as much as there was headaches there, I love that because that made this difference. This is what I love to do. And touching base with those things, going back to that aspect of what brings us reward, gives us a lot of energy to really stay focused on priorities. Because I, it seems that the more intense I get, the greater the tendency is for me to simply have my head down and do the next task in front of me, whether it's important, whether it's a priority, or whether it's not. So let me share with you what I am convinced is your number one priority, if you're a leader at all. I know, a little presumptuous of me to tell you your number one priority. I'd be a little, who's this guy think he is? But that's all right. Be gracious with me for a moment. I think if you're a leader, your number one priority is to develop leaders. 
Why do I believe that? Yes, it's best for your organization. Whether you're leading a lot of people or one other person, developing other people, that's definitely best for the organization. It might be volunteers, it might be that intern student that you have working with you, your first official staff person, or whatever your scenario is, developing other people is, is, is good for your organization. It's hard work, but it's good. It's key for your future success. You're not going to be able to grow and take on new challenges if you keep doing and have to keep doing all the stuff you're currently doing. But I think more than that, the number one reason why this is key is you're the only one who can. It takes a leader to raise up a leader. And although we can probably find leaders that were self-made individuals, we seldom list them as great examples of the character of leadership that we're looking for. They might have certain strengths that they've just brought into the job, but most of the time they also have a lot of glaring problems to their leadership because they haven't learned. I was actually sitting with a, a young leader just recently and he said as much as he's loved his journey so far as a professional and he's, he's been in several different roles and he's uh, basically about six years, seven years in the workforce after his university, he said well, he thinks what he really wants for his next step is to be under a strong leader that really he can just learn and grow from because he's not had that opportunity. <clears throat> and I, I love to hear that because you've got a young leader that recognizes his biggest weakness is himself. And his biggest challenge is all the things he doesn't know. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's so critical because it takes a leader to make a leader. And in fact, that can always be proved by the fact that all you have to do is sit down sometime and go, now, who are the leaders that impacted my life and how do I try to be like them? And every one of us as leaders will come up with a fairly particular list. You might have a long list or you might have three people and this was so and so, this was so and so, but without you really thinking about it, they shaped your idea of leadership and how you now interact with every single person you lead. Because it takes a leader to make a leader. So that's why I believe that it's, it's so fundamental and I mean, how many times have you heard or have you been part of the conversation about how do I develop leaders? I don't have time. There's just so much to do. I just can't keep up with everything. There's all these problems. And a couple months ago, we talked about the hamster wheel that we get onto, that I, I don't have time to keep up with everything. I need other qualified people. I don't have time to develop qualified people. I, I've got too many things to do. And we get in this. And, you know, I, I mentioned at that time, the thing with hamster wheels is we all get on them. We all hope that there's a wonderful, nice, easy way we could exit them. But there isn't. We either slow this thing down ourselves and it's going to take some bumps and bruises and we make our exit or at some point in time the hamster wheel throws us off. But we are going to exit the hamster wheel one way or the other because you just can't keep going like that. It costs something. It costs in your life, it costs in your health, it costs in your family or it costs in your productivity or just your sanity sometimes. But at some point in time you realize I have got to be developing leaders and I have never been in a point in my leadership when I said good because I, I had all this extra time that I didn't know what to do with. I had all of Wednesday just sitting around waiting for something to do. I'll develop leaders. I've never been that guy. It's always had to been, I'm going to have to carve out time, I'm going to have to make sacrifices, I'm going to have to negotiate some space to make room for new leaders and to develop them, to invest in them, and to make them part of the process. And I don't know about you when you were growing up, but my mom had a phrase every now and then that she said to, to us boys, and that would be, oh, it would be quicker for me to do it myself. And I gotta be honest, I, I hate to confess this, Mom, if you ever see this, just, you know, I'm sorry, but at times we use that to our advantage. Okay, if we do a bad job, Mom will just take over. We no longer have to do this. And I, I think, you know, moms just have too much on their plate most days, so they do. But as leaders, we can really slip into that. It's just, it's quicker, and it is quicker to do it yourself. It is. It's just not quicker in the long run. It's not productive in the long run. It doesn't keep you uh, able to dream into great things. So often what happens is leaders then decide, I need that chance to dream and do big things. I'll change where I work. I'll change where I lead. Because at least the new change will bring me that chance to do something new and exciting. Instead of growing the hard work of new leaders so that I can say, good, now that I've got these, now where can we go? 
What can we do? How, how can we dream bigger? And I think that's the harder work, but it's so critical. And that's why John has another chapter that I, I paired with this one. That's the law of explosive growth. Now, the law of explosive growth simply says this, to add growth, lead followers, to multiply, lead leaders. In my leadership so far, I've done both. And there's seasons sometimes where you're, you're adding followers. There's seasons. There's times where you've kind of got both relationships. You've got your follower relationships and you're developing your leader relationships. I've always been very interested in the journey, the chronological journey of Jesus' ministry. Because the closer he got to the cross date, shall we say, the more we see him with this phrase, I'm trying to get away just with the twelve. I have a theory that him walking on water and inviting the disciples to join him wasn't so much about the miracle of the water. It was just because out there the crowds wouldn't have found them and he could have finally had some time just with the twelve. Because I doubt that they would have run into people in the middle of a lake walking on it that, that needed ministry. That's my theory. I, I'm, I'm just working with that one. You can take it or leave it, but that's, that's my theory on that one. Because he was consistently looking for this chance to get alone and develop these. He was already. He was empowering them, but he was still looking for that struggle that there was all these followers that always wanted his time. And he was constantly trying to carve out time for really developing leaders, multiplying leaders. So I'm encouraged at times because Jesus is such a great example in my life. And if he struggled to make time for carving out leaders, I know it's a priority, but it also doesn't mean that I'm somehow failing when I struggle to do as well. So that, that's always been an encouragement to me. I like what John has in this chapter when he talks about multiplying leaders. He compares the two, so I'm just going to go through the list. Leaders who attract followers. Leaders who develop leaders. Leaders who attract followers need to be needed, whereas those who develop leaders want to be succeeded. The first, they develop the bottom 20%. The second, develop the top 20%. First group, focus on weaknesses. The second, focus on strengths. First, treat everyone the same. The second, treat individuals differently. First, spend time with others. And the second, they invest time in others. The first, grow by addition. And the others, grow by multiplication. The first, impact only people they touch. The others impact people beyond their reach. As I said, when I was early in becoming intentional in leadership, I was going through this book, and this was one of the things that really struck me. I just, I have a bent to developing leaders. It's just, that's, that's my favorite thing in life. That's, I, get, I get charged over that more than anything. And I, when I get the opportunity to teach here at the college with the, the new students and teach them some leadership basics, I, I, I love it. Don't, don't tell Rob, but I do it probably for free. Um, don't tell Rob. <laughs> um, I just, the opportunity to work with young leaders and to challenge them to become intentional about leadership at that stage of their life will produce such big dividends down the road in their life. There's things I wish I'd been intentional about in my 20s and in my 30s that I'm just becoming intentional about now. I guess that's life. But I love that opportunity. And I, I, I love, I kind of just, I'm wired for this. But when I was reading this book and really starting to, this was starting to click, I realized two things. One, developing leaders takes a lot more work than gathering followers. and takes a lot more time. But we had the privilege of being at Lawson uh, as uh, associate pastors there for a little over nine years. And towards the end of that time, we had fellows that had been students in our youth group that had become you know, leaders in the youth group, young adult leaders, and now we're leading in the church. And my wife and I were saying, you know, it's probably our favorite thing to watch these guys. And some of them are now doing things. Like when I was interim senior pastor for my last stretch there, one of my right-hand guy in youth took over the youth group. And they grew rapidly under his leadership. Uh, like every time he turned around, someone was getting saved, someone was attending new, and I'm going, well, first off, what are you doing that I wasn't doing? Come on. But he was a different personality. He was a different skill set. But it was such an honor for me to realize that I were seeing individuals somehow stumbling forward in leadership. 90% of the time, so uncertain if I was getting this right and how to do this and wishing I could do more, but just becoming intentional about the key leaders I needed to focus on. And just watching those guys step up 
to, to leadership and then watching them do some things better than you did and you're like going, you know, this is really rewarding. This, that, that right there. I don't need anybody to pat me on the back or say, well done. Watching that guy do a better job leadership-wise at that than I've done. Yeah, that one, that one sticks with me. That's worth it all. So I just wanted to challenge you with those, those two areas. Law of priorities, because obviously you really can't empower leaders if you're not clear on the priorities and if you don't put those new leaders into your top 20%. And even if you're in a situation where you're going, well, I don't really have anybody right now that I'd be leading and developing, make that space, start to look into that. Because you don't want to recognize, I guess I should have been developing this person six months ago. It would be easier to come into it going, oh look, here's a person that maybe I could develop and they can become a key leader. It's easier to start the process before the, the desperate need hits you. It's always harder to start developing leaders once you're in that state, state of desperate need. So that's just my advice. I'm going to ask you to, we, we like to wrap up with some table talk, just share a few questions. You've got a couple there, three questions uh, on your handout. Um, are you clear on your why and your priorities? So just give it a scale of one, I'm unclear, to five, it's crystal clear, and uh, just talk a little bit about that. And then um, really get to this question, what do you need to do to bring greater clarity to your priorities? The final question, or two there, who are you developing, who should you be developing? I, I think you can share that if you have time, but really that's one of those longer term, percolate on that for a while. Um, and maybe you already have a clear list, you've got people, and you're very strategic and you just want to reflect on how do I improve that or how do I take them to that level. They're growing as a leader, it, very early in the game they should start developing other people, it's the best way we learn as leaders. And so uh, that might be the process, but really focus on those first two questions and, and enjoy the rest of your conversation, thank you so much.